welcome to the continuing part of transport of gases so in the last session we discussed regarding the transport of o2 and transport of co2 in a glance and now in this session we are going to discuss regarding the transport of o2 first the first one is the transport of oxygen now already we know oxygen is transported mainly in two forms one 97% of oxygen is transported in the form of oxyhemoglobin and 3% of oxygen is transported by the plasma of the blood now in the transport of oxygen how exactly it is transported now oxygen combines with the hemoglobin to form into hbo2 four times okay now here oxygen combines with hemoglobin to form into hbo2 four times this is what is called as a oxy hemoglobin that means one hemoglobin molecule one hb it carries an iron four iron containing pigment fe pigments each of these will bind to one oxygen molecule one o2 molecule so that's why one molecule of hemoglobin carries four molecules of oxygen so that's why it is transported mainly in the form of a hemoglobin oxy hemoglobin then transport of oxygen occurs from where to where transport of oxygen occurs from lungs to tissues through the blood then what are the factors which are responsible for the transport uh, the binding of oxygen to the hemoglobin and then later on the transport process so first one is there are certain conditions what are the conditions for the formation of oxy hemoglobin in the lungs the conditions are partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs we are talking about in lungs to form oxy hemoglobin what are the conditions po2 its level should be high higher the partial pressure of oxygen then only it binds to the hemoglobin then pco2 level it should be low or less then h plus concentration should be low that means ph should be low then apart from this temperature temperature should be low that means sir all these factors will influence on binding of oxygen to hemoglobin in the lungs that means sir look at this po2 level should be high the rest three 1 2 3 their level should be low then only it helps in association of oxygen with that of the hemoglobin to form into oxy hemoglobin so this process should occur in the lung and as it occurs in the lungs these are the factors which are responsible for the formation of oxy hemoglobin that means to bind oxygen with that of the hemoglobin hb first po2 level should be high co2 level p partial pressure of carbon dioxide level should be less h plus hydrogen ion concentration should be less then temperature should be low then only it helps in association if exactly reverse occurs it it leads to dissociation association occurs in the lungs dissociation occurs in the body tissues okay exactly reverse remember these factors the same factors okay let us write it as association association of what association of oxy hemoglobin then to break the oxy hemoglobin that means that this oxy hemoglobin should be broken down to form into o2 and hb hb has to be released back now dissociation if we come across the dissociation we are taking the same factors only what should be the condition in the tissues to break down oxy hemoglobin because uh, this is a if it binds a temporarily with hemoglobin because if there is strong affinity then hb and o2 won't dissociate if it doesn't dissociate then how the cells will get the oxygen for our cellular respiration okay now here for the dissociation this occurs in the lungs this occurs in the tissues what should be the condition in the tissue 
PO2 level should be low. Then next one five. PCO2 high. Then H plus concentration should be high. Temperature should be high. Okay, this. O2 should be low. CO2 high. H plus high. Temperature high. So higher the concentration of these three, lower the concentration of oxygen will lead to dissociation of oxygen hemoglobin into oxygen and hemoglobin. This occurs in the tissues and association occurs in the lungs. Here association, dissociation, association, dissociation. It is a continuous process, a constant process until you take your last breath. Okay, so that is regarding the process of association and dissociation. Okay. So with this, let's uh, move on to the oxygen dissociation curve. So how exactly the oxygen dissociation curve is observed? Now oxygen dissociation curve, what we say is first it, it has to get associated, later on it gets a dissociated. Okay, now here we have a diagram. Now in this diagram, what we see, now here we are 20, 40, 60, 80 and 100. Here we are 20, 40. 60, 80, and 100. This is a partial pressure of a O2. This is in a mm of a Hg. This is a percentage of a saturation of a hemoglobin with oxygen. Okay. So in this graph, we get a curve here, where we call it as oxygen dissociation curve. What exactly it means? This is a partial pressure of oxygen. This is a saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen. That means oxygen should combine with the hemoglobin. Hemoglobin will be flowing in our blood vessels. Suppose if the concentration of oxygen is a 20 mm of Hg, then ultimately it binds. 40, again binding, it increases. 60, 80, it binds. 100, it gets saturated. Okay, so almost the point of saturation is around 98% only. The saturation point is around 98% only, by which the oxygen will bind with the hemoglobin, it gets saturated. Okay, now the, if we increase the concentration of oxygen, the binding of a hemoglobin with oxygen also increases but up to a certain level. Later on it does not increase. If you still increase the concentration of a O2, then the concentration of a, uh, oxygen binding to hemoglobin does not increase because it gets saturated. Okay, this is you already know. This is what is called as a oxygen uh, dissociation curve. Okay, now here first process is association and next how it can dissociate. Suppose if the concentration of the oxygen is reduced, if the concentration of oxygen is reduced, then what will happen? Then the curve will shift towards the lower side. That means it does not bind with the hemoglobin oxygen because of a lack of oxygen. Okay, then what will happen if its concentration is a little bit increased? Okay, if it is increased from the normal level, it may little bit shift towards the left side. That means this is a normal. The curve may shift little bit towards the left side. It may get shifted towards the right side. So if it is getting shifted towards the right side, this leads to dissociation. This is an oxygen dissociation curve and this curve, this is called as a Bohr's curve. 
we call it as a force curve. Okay. Now, why does this happen? So, due to increased concentration of a CO2. Higher the concentration of CO2 leads to dissociation of a oxygen with hemoglobin. Lower the concentration of a CO2 leads to association of a oxygen with that of hemoglobin. That means, sir, if we increase the concentration of CO2 in our tissues, then ultimately the binding of oxygen with that of the hemoglobin definitely decreases. That's why this type of curve is called as a force curve. Okay, and uh, based on this, we call it as a force uh, graph also. Okay. Then how can we define the force curve? We also call it as a force effect also. And in this what we can say is a dissociation of oxygen hemoglobin. Dissociation of oxygen hemoglobin. That means oxygen hemoglobin gets a dissociated into O2 and HP into O2 and HP. That means into oxygen and hemoglobin at low or acidic pH. At low or acidic pH. Then what does it mean? It is due to is uh, due to increased CO2 concentration. So increased CO2 concentration will lead to dissociation of a hemoglobin with that of oxygen. Okay, so that's why we call this process as a Bose effect. Then where does the process occurs? This process generally occurs in the tissues. Dissociation will occur in the tissue. Okay, so this is the Bohr's curve, this is the normal curve. This is a, if a CO2 level is a very less. Okay, association is also increased. Okay, this is one Bohr's effect, which is an additional part. Apart from this, we have one more, which is called as a Haldane effect. Okay, now where the, this process occurs, this process it generally occurs in the tissues. This occurs in tissues. Then next one is a Haldane effect. Then what is this Haldane effect? So if you look at the Haldane effect, the binding of O2 to HP, the binding of O2 to HP, that makes it oxygen will bind to the hemoglobin causes causes the release of it causes the release of CO2 from blood causes the release of CO2 from blood and uh, here this occurs generally occurs in the lungs okay now look at this part. What does it say? Hallen effect, the binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. The binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. It causes the release of carbon dioxide from the blood. That means from the blood, where the carbon dioxide concentration is more, that comes towards the lungs. Carbon dioxide has to be released outside, which is called as the Hallen effect. Then what he says? If a CO2 concentration is increased, uh, if it is there more, if CO2 gets released, then it helps in binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. Release of CO2 helps in binding of O2 to the HB. This occurs in the lungs. In the lungs, what can we say generally? In lungs, Hallen effect will occur. In the tissues, Bohr's effect will occur. Because of Bohr's effect, what it says is that dissociation of oxyhemoglobin Bohr's effect is a dissociation of oxyhemoglobin Halden effect is a association of 
oxygen along with hemoglobin. So one is dissociation, one is association. Dissociation occurs in the tissues, association occurs in the lungs. Bohr's effect, Hallen effect. The Bohr's effect, Hallen effect. They work simultaneously and continuously. Okay. So this is regarding the part of a oxygen dissociation curve. Okay. Now here we have we call this curve as a Bohr's curve. This is the normal curve. Call it as a normal curve. And uh, other one, it is a this curve. It is a in absence of CO2 and uh, with the higher level of O2. Okay. So this is regarding the part. Now, what is the amount of oxygen that is uh, transported in the blood to the tissues? So every 100 ml of blood, suppose if we take that, then every 100 ml of oxygenated blood delivers 5 ml of oxygen to the tissues. Okay, this is most important. Every 100 ml of oxygenated blood, it carries 5 ml of oxygenated to the tissues. Okay, and uh, this point will be asked. This is with respect to oxygen. Because uh, with respect to this level, we come across the same level in carbon dioxide transport. And uh, there also we come across the same statement. Only change is that with respect to transport of carbon dioxide, I am telling you well in advance. Every 100 ml of here we have the oxygenated blood. That side, the oxygenated blood delivers 4 ml of CO2 to the lungs. Look at this. Every 100 ml of oxygenated blood supplies 5 ml of oxygen to the tissues. Every 100 ml of deoxygenated blood delivers 4 ml of CO2 to the lungs. Okay, so here this is transport of O2 and this is transport of CO2. Remember this. Okay, so this is regarding the part of a transport of a oxygen. And in the next part, we will discuss regarding the transport of a carbon dioxide. And the transport of carbon dioxide is a little bit an elaborate way. As already we know, carbon dioxide is transported majorly in three forms. First as carbonic acid, then as a carbamine hemoglobin and as a bicarbonates. Out of these three, 70% of the CO2 is transported in which form? Yes, 70% of carbon dioxide is transported in the form of a bicarbonates. Okay, remember that is the major part. So how exactly? We will discuss it.